Edward Said, een Arabier met een westerse opvoeding. Met een omvangrijk oeuvre op het gebied van literatuurwetenschap, muziek en politiek is hij een van de meest invloedrijke cultuurcritici van onze tijd. Internationale faam kreeg hij door zijn onafhankelijk optreden als pleitbezorger van de Palestijnse zaak. Edward Said, you were born in a country that no longer exists. You were brought up a Christian in a predominantly Muslim world. You live most of your life in New York as an Arab in a predominantly Jewish city. And you're finally a pianist in the literary faculty of university. Now, that is quite confusing, seen on paper. Right. Nonetheless, that is one person combining these things. Who are you? Well, I, I, I think I identify myself really as a kind of um, intellectual person who travels a lot between things. I don't think of myself as inhabiting a field or a place, really. I mean, obviously, I have an address, <laughs> but, I, but you know, it's, not, it's not an address that means that much to me. You know, I, 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 think, uh, I like to think of myself as a sort of energy in motion. Um, and I've never believed in the notion of professionalism. That is to say that you become a professional and do only that. I've spent a lot of time invading other fields, fields that are not my own, uh, like music or uh, various forms of area studies, anthropology and so on and so forth. Because I believe, I think in the end, that uh, a rational effort uh, can overcome most of the obstacles laid before one. And in my case, they, they're political as well, you know, because as you said, uh, I, I was born in a country that doesn't exist anymore. It's called Palestine. Um, and that loss, I think, signified to me a tremendous need to make up for it in some way and to live in different countries of my own making, as a matter of, speak, as a matter of fact. There yeah. was a country which was not of your making in your youth, in your early years, mm. and you describe it in your memoir, Out of Place, mm. as a strangely Continuous, conti continuous country. Mm. You grew up in Cairo, in Egypt, mm. but um, traveling to the Lebanon for holidays, to uh, Palestine for family visits, it was all very easy, mm -hmm. as if there was one part of the world without obstacles, was right. it? I mean, I felt it as continuous. I mean, there were different places. I mean, certainly I felt that Palestine, which is where my family was from, was the only place where I felt truly at home, because all my extended family was there. Uh, and we would spend long periods of time there. For example, during the war, 42, we spent most of that year in Palestine. Uh, and I went to school and uh, we spent the summer in Ramallah, which was then a summer resort. It's now the main city on the West Bank. Um, and Lebanon, we used to spend our summers. Uh, and each of them had its own flavor. But I never felt, and its own, you know, cast of characters, you know, the, the grocer in one place. And I was, because of the way my mind was worked, was made up and the way we moved, I was always comparing, you know, and, and the grocer in Cairo versus the grocer in Lebanon and the uh, handyman in P Palestine and the handyman in Cairo and so on and so on. But my relatives were mainly in Palestine. But, but no family in, in Egypt. So the handymans from the different places, yeah. the grocers from the, did they belong to one culture? Yes, I think they did. I mean, most of them were Arabs spoke Arabic. The lingua franca was Arabic. And even in school, uh, for example, the last school I went to in Cairo, which is called Victoria College, which is where King Hussein went and where, um, I was going to say, Michel Shalhoub, Omar Sharif, the actor. Um, it was a good school. It, well, well, it was supposed to be a good school. Yeah. But I mean, I, I didn't really learn that much there because it was, it was very combative and hostile because the teachers were all English and we were all something else. Now, in that school, there were Italians, there were Greeks, there were Armenians, there were many different kinds of Arabs, there were many different kinds of Jews, Sephardic Jews, European Jews, and so on. 
And yet, uh, that sense of, uh, of difference, uh, we were all brought together by the fact that we lived in an Islamic country and that the language was Arabic. Um, so there was, a, there was a kind of unity there. Unity uh, in uh, diversity. Yes, but, but there was another reason to be brought to, together. The, the college was not without reason called Victoria College. Oh, absolutely. It was, it was a triumph of, of British imperialism, where you were taught that you could learn about England which is what we did all the time. We never learned anything about where we were. I mean, there was no... What did you learn? Well, I learned all about, uh, you know, the English kings. I remember very clearly uh, in my first year, I wrote, uh, I thought, an excellent essay for history on the enclosure system at the end of the 18th century, you know, in all the fields, the all common the fields, were, yeah, were suddenly enclosed, you know, by, by proprietors, which was a major social chain. It meant absolutely nothing to me. But I mastered all the facts, and I produced an essay that I got an A on or something, or an A minus. Which was abstract work. Totally, totally. It had nothing to do with anything. And it, it's quite remarkable that since that time, my, my imagination is now concentrated on, ge on geography in a certain way, and that all my work has a kind of geographical basis to it, rather than a temporal or historical basis. But, but in any case, uh, so we learned about Britain as the sovereign center met met metropole of the world, which it was in those days. And we were taught that we, that we could learn about it, but we could never become it. So, I mean, that was the, the, the core of British education, imperial education, that you could learn the language, you could learn the history as a subject, but not as a participant in it, not as somebody who belonged to it. So it, there, was a, there was a sense of inferiority with it, you see. Did this lead to a sort of double lingua franca? I yeah. mean, Arabic coming from home, which, which bound all these various people together, right. and um, English being, English not only as a natural language, but also as a system of thought, being the program of instruction, yeah. and thereby... Um, that, 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 was, uh, that, was my, that was my experience. I mean, it yeah. wasn't everybody's, because I mean, I suppose some of the people in school, for example, some of the Jewish boys, um, tended to speak French at home, you know, right? We happen to speak Arabic, and I've never really known which is my first language. I mean, I always went between English and Arabic, and later French, because so many of my schoolmates spoke French. But there was because, no you, and because your parents both spoke English as well. Yeah, they already. both spoke English as well. My mother was educated in the American system. My father was educated in the English system. Uh, and then he went to America and, of course, spoke... Uh, but, he, but, his, but his English was not his native language. His native language was Arabic, and you could hear it in, in his voice and in his intonation. And the same with my mother. Did they ever connect the Arabian l layer from which you came and the superstructure of the English culture? No, no? never. They were always kept separate. Uh, the, the, the Arabic superstructure, uh, rather sub, substratum, yeah. The home stratum was always for me the language of intimacy, the language of familiarity, the language one spoke to the quote unquote natives, you see, and the language we spoke amongst ourselves as a subversive language at school because the first, the rule of the school in, in, in Victoria College was English is the first language. English is the language of school. Anybody speaking any other language will be punished severely. So we spoke Arabic as a way of defying the teachers. Um, but there was no intellectual connection between them. I yeah. knew nothing about Arabic literature, about Arabic history. Whatever I knew, I knew on my own or through what I heard at home or from relatives and so on and so forth. Um, but for example, music. You're a music lover. You've been so since a very young very age. Very young age. Yeah. What sort of music? Arabic always music? Western music. Always, always, Western, always music. Western music. Yeah. I, the first concert I think I was taken to was to a concert by Umm Kalsum, who was the most famous singer at the time. And it was a dreadful experience for me. I think I was eight or nine. I, I didn't like, I mean, first of all, it didn't begin until 10 o'clock at night. I was half asleep. I was, you know, I was a kid. And there was this great crowded theater. There didn't seem to be any order to it. Um, the musicians would wander on stage and sit down and play a little bit, wander off, and then come back. And finally, she would appear, and they would sing together and with, this, with her orchestra. And her songs would go on for 40 to 45 minutes. And to me, there, there wasn't the kind of form or shape. It seemed to be all more or less the same. And uh, the tone was mournful, melancholic. I didn't understand the words. Above all, what I missed, I realize now, what I missed was counterpoint. It's, it's very monophonic music, and it would, I think it's designed to send people, not exactly into a stupor, but it would induce a kind of melancholic haze, which people like, and I found very disturbing. I mean, mentally it made you inactive, I think. I mean, it's entirely subjective. 
So I very early on rejected it and f began to focus exclusively on Western music, for which I hungered more and more. For example, the songs you sang, were they in English? English, song, English, English songs. Yes, but no I used to, song. never, uh, except f three maybe songs that I used to associate with my family, especially my mother. And when there were family gatherings, for example, in Lebanon, half of my mother's family was Lebanese, so we had a lot of Lebanese relatives. And I recall also in Palestine, my mother's brother w used to play the oud. And they would sing songs that were unfamiliar to me, but I could catch the, the theme. I would remember a few of the words. But compared to the richness that I, of the Western music that I was getting through records, we didn't have any records at home, Arabic records. We had lots of Western records, very haphazard collection, lots of Beethoven, uh, lots of Mozart, a little bit of Bach, very little Wagner, a little bit of Richard Strauss. I, I learned all that at home. Rossini, I loved Rossini at a very early age. That was more coherent, and, and it was something that I was studying as a pianist. Uh, not a very good pianist, but I was studying it. Whereas the Arabic stuff was, was always smaller, and it, 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 would, it wasn't consistent. It wasn't part of my daily life, the routine of my life. And in church? You, you were brought up in the Church of England? Yes, I was brought up in the church, both. In, I was saying hymns in, Ar in Arabic and in English, but I never could get, because, of course, the schools I went to, the first schools, were also, re I mean, we had religion. Yeah. And as a small boy, we had, every day, we had to sing hymns in the morning before the school began, and they were all English hymns. Now, occasionally, when we were in Jerusalem, I would go to Arabic services, and they were the same hymns, except with Arabic words. So, you know, since I was more familiar with the English, the Arabic words would just go by me. I could sing them, and I could sort of read them, but they didn't make the impression that onward Christian soldiers. <laughs> you know, that, made a, that made a great impression on me, you know. Yeah. And, oh, God, our help in, you know. Yeah. There are Arabic words for that, too, but completely different. I mean, is, without the same triumphalism and the same marching quality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, so the church was really also an English experience. And, and does this introduce a sort of say, cultural schizophrenia? I don't know that it was schizophrenia. I just thought it was different parts of my life, you know, that I still feel that. Yeah. I mean, for example, now the language I speak at home with my wife, who's an Arab, is Arabic. And now that my oldest son has learned Arabic, although he grew up in New York and was born in America, he speaks Arabic too. We speak Arabic. So I, I think of it as really different parts of my experience. And I, I, it's not at all, no, it's not schizophrenia. It's the, the older I grow, the more I feel I bring them together in some way. It's, it's, like, a, it's like polyphony. It's like counterpoint. I, that's the way but I But what a change in life, S speaking for tens of years, yeah. English with your song, yes. and then changing yes. to Arabic. Arabic. Yes, it's, yeah. it's astonishing. It's astonishing. In a, in a way, we're all converting. Them. My daughter, who doesn't speak any Arabic at all, understands. So if I say something to her in Arabic, she, she says yes or no, etc. But she refuses to answer in Arabic because she doesn't know it well enough but she too finds it also part of her part, part of her uh, you know her, of her apparatus yeah. what does it mean this yes this, this this going back to the language well I think I don't really know it's it's a it's a very interesting point I it's not really going back it's that giving it's giving it more no, prominence yeah, yeah. it's giving it more prominence it yeah. was there all along and and during the, the course of the last I say 20 25 years I felt myself to be growing back into a part of my life that, especially during my later education, yeah. I had completely, reje not rejected, just put aside. You know, it's like putting something on a shelf, like a book, uh, a book that you read once or knew about, put it on a shelf, don't look at it for 20 or 25 or 30 years, and then you bring it down, you start reading it again, it comes back to you, and then it becomes a, a part of your daily experience. And I think that's what happened. You described the Arabic world of your youth, as I said, as a continuum. Mm. When did it break the continuum? Well, I think 48 for me, uh, because I never, I never went back to Palestine. And by the spring of night, we left, my, my immediate family, my parents and my uh, sisters and I, left Palestine in December of 1947 for the last time. We went to Cairo. And one of the reasons we couldn't stay in Jerusalem was because the British had divided the city into zones, zone A, zone B, etc. We lived in zone A, let's say, and my school was in zone D. When I turned 12, which was in November of 47, I needed a pass. I couldn't, before that, I could go directly, you know, because I was too young. But then I needed a pass. And then the question of renewing the pass, it, it just became logistically very hard. And of course, I think, I don't know, because both of my parents are dead. But uh, at the time, my impression is that it seemed to them that the situation was getting too tense for us to stay as we used to. 
and I was getting too old, and you know, my sisters, uh, you know, the education had to be continuous. So then we went back to Cairo. Uh, uh, two or three months later, the rest of my family, my aunts, my cousins, my grandparents, my grandmother, uh, uncles, aunts, etc., all left Palestine. And that is upon the foundation of the State of the Israel. State of Israel. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, not so much the foundation, but the, the campaign to rid Palestine of as many Arabs as possible. So my family was part of about 850,000, 800,000 Palestinians who are now, you know, about four and a half million refugees today. Were you aware on the moment it happened what really was happening? Or is this no. some sort of um, hindsight? Well, it's not so much hindsight, it's, it's really, it's a kind of posterior or retrospective identification of things that puzzled me. Why was my father's cousin, Bir Shammas, whom I used to see in Jerusalem as a rather prosperous and confident man, why did he appear in Cairo in the middle of 1948, dressed in a very threadbare suit, much reduced in size and weight, very sad, living in, in what, to me, at the age of 12, appeared to be poverty? You know, there were, no, there were no immediate answers to be had. My father was not an uh, uh, expansive man. He didn't speak about it. And we were decidedly unpolitical. My family, uh, as many middle class families did in Palestine and in the Arab world, uh, insulated themselves from politics. Politics was thought to be done by other people, lesser people, or professional politicians who belonged to the notable Muslim families. We were minority Christians, so we didn't participate in, in politics. So a lot went happened that I didn't understand. So retrospectively, I was able to interpret it as having to do with the fall of Palestine. Was there a feeling of protest in your family? No, I don't think so. I think it was a feeling of sadness and occasionally anger. Uh, I remember very clearly, uh, for example, in April of 1948, very, very clearly, shortly after Deir Yassin, which is the biggest Arab massacre that done yeah. by the Irgun in that village, um, just outside of Jerusalem, my aunt and my cousin, her daughter, were talking about it with great passion as how the, the Jews entered the village, killed 250 people, and took away the women uh, and paraded them through the streets of uh, West Jerusalem or whatever part of, or Tel Aviv, naked. I mean, that made a tremendous impression on me. And so I think there was a sense of anger and impotence at the same time, because yeah. there was nothing we could do about it. No feeling of organizing? No, 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 no. There was no organizing. Look, a lot of what happened in 1948 had already, in a certain sense, happened before. Yeah. There was a great uprising of the Palestinians against the British between 1936 and 1939. It was called a Great Re Rebellion. And it was against British imperialism in protest against the Zionist, uh, incoming Zionists, who were being favored by the British, we thought. So there was a great revolution. And during that time, I think, occurred what was to, de to determine the fate of the Palestinians in 1948. All the organizations were destroyed by the British. The leaders, some of whom I now know, their children and so on, were exiled to the Seychelles Islands, to Rhodesia and so on. And the national movement was broken. During the time after that, after 39, the, the Jews became powerful. And they were organized by the British. Uh, they served in World War II with the British, uh, and they were organized and had arms much more than all the Arab, you know, the story they used to say the Arab armies invaded and they were going to kill. There was, there was no hope of that at all. A, because the Arab armies were much smaller, badly organized, poorly armed versus the, the Jews. Second, because the Jews and the Jordanians had already arranged to divide the West Bank, to divide Palestine. So all of this was unknown to us, but you know, we, we've discovered it since. Yeah. So there was well, no whilst all these things were developing between, say, 48 and 56, to, to give two key dates, yes. you were following your I was good British edu education. Right. Um, in, and then American. In, in, then, then American imbibed with the values of the Anglo-American culture. You say... Um, you no, 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 wait. Not imbibed with the values. Imbibed with the knowledge. I never, it's quite interesting. The knowledge back. without values? Well, without those values. In other words, I reserved for myself the right to read what they told me I to read, and yet think differently. So that at the same time that I was reading about, um, let's say, uh, American history and American, uh, the foundation of the, of the American Republic, I was very aware that there was a great difference between that history and its pretended ideals, and what I saw in the world from which I came, which is quite different. Really? At, yeah, at age 15, 16? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That, when I first came to America, I took a course in America, you were required to take a course in American history. And I remember thinking then how quickly 
because I was aware of it, having read it from the British point of view, yeah. how quickly they passed over what happened to the Indians, right? What happened to the blacks? The whole, the whole question of slavery in the, in the early 50s when I was a student, in the textbooks of that time, were completely elided. Don't forget, very interesting, it's just I, how important a personality in our lives in Egypt, quite by chance, Paul Robeson was. I mean, we had his records. I grew up on Paul Robeson, singing Mother McCree, singing the song of the Volga Boatman. I mean, I remember it yeah. so clearly. And then I read about him, and I remember what happened to him. And then I heard and, and took courses in American literature and American um, uh, history, and I noticed, well, what happened to the slaves? There's simply no mention of them. Lost. The idealization and the, and the, and the, and the mythification of American intervention abroad, the Philippines, the Spanish-American War, all of those things. I was easily aware, quickly aware, that there was some discrepancy. I didn't quite understand it, but I realized that what we were given in the book and what I lived and what I knew about, whether in the colonies or as a non-white, uh, there was a discrepancy. I didn't understand the discrepancy, but I knew there was one. The book that made you most famous later in life is Orientalism, right. in which essentially the thesis is um, you invented us. The idea of the Orient is an idea of the Occident. Right. What you say about that part of the world, its culture and its history, is predominantly fabricated by your minds, which grew up in a colonial imperialist history, yeah. without talking about the values, we return to that later on. Right. So what you're actually saying is that the idea of Orientalism already arises during your school days. Absolutely. I'll tell you what, it's not so much that, it's that they invented, but that their description of the experience of being an Oriental, of what it was like to be an Arab or a Muslim or an Indian or whatever, didn't correspond to my experience. And very early on, I realized that there were two issues of, of major importance. One was the fact that we were weaker, that we were a lesser people. And we were trained by education and by social organization, and the presence of British troops in an Arab... I was easy, very quickly aware of that. You, you would have to be a fool not to be. What were all these troops doing in Cairo during the war and in Palestine uh, before 1948? That's number one. And the second thing is that there were two standards. There was one standard for the Englishman and there was one standard for us. And the lives that we led as lesser people had very little to do with what they said the Oriental was. Uh, for example, I felt myself to be totally equal to the British kids uh, and to the Americans. But somehow, by the doctrine of Orientalism, I was meant to be different and lesser. And I didn't feel that. And that's where the, that's where the experience derives from. But you can react in, in, in two different forms. You can say, well, that's that point. Right. Um, and, and your school career and later your university career right. was so um, um, successful right. that you were an equal on a certain date. I didn't really feel it. You know, I, 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 I always felt I was denied the kind of recognition that I felt I deserved. Uh, for example, in the American school I went to, when I first came to America in 1951, my father sent me to a boarding school that was very austere. It was in New England, in western Massachusetts, in a cold climate, which I'd never been in before. I was extremely lonely and unhappy. I felt I was one of the few foreigners in the school. They were all Americans, mostly from Massachusetts and the Northeast. Um, and, and one of the things I felt was that, um, although I was clever, you know, I had a British education much more advanced, much more uh, concentrated than the American. So I was quickly able to rise to the top of the class. When the graduation finally occurred in my last year, I was there for two years, I was either first or second in the class. But at the graduation, I was not recognized as either first or second. They put me aside for somebody else. There was some standard used that denied me that recognition. And so I became immediately suspicious of power that masks itself as judgment and fairness, but in reality is arbitrary. And I think I was passed over because I was different. And they wanted some two Americans rather than this strange mixture of foreigners. And, and so from, from the beginning, I felt that I wasn't successful in quite the same way. And I think early on, I determined that my way would have to be different. In other words, I, I would continue. I would go, go through the motions. You know, you can get A's and so on in school. I, it's not difficult. I mean, I didn't find it difficult. But the real path that I wanted to follow was my, of my own making. 
uh, I didn't have a con conventional career. I had an unconventional career. Yeah, but, but, but there is something of a double bind in that. I mean a double bind with, say, the, the imperialist schooling. Yes. Um, on the one hand, you're at a very young age aware of the double standard. On the other hand, if that is on the other hand, you're the one who um, dives into their literature, into their yeah, but, music, but look at into the, their art. Yeah, but look at the way I dived in. I mean, my, for example, the first extended piece of work I did was on Conrad. Yeah. Now, Conrad in the early 60s was scarcely known. I mean, he wasn't, now he's an industry. But in those days, Conrad was considered a kind of, well, I mean, E.M. Forster said, you know, there's something wrong about him, you know, yeah. mysterious. Yeah. And, and, and all the people who admired him, like James and T.S. Eliot, thought of him as a peculiar man. Well, that's what attracted me to him, that yeah. he wasn't the routine Englishman. And he, moreover, he was, again, a stranger out of place in England. And masking himself as an Englishman, yeah. you see. And I felt that I was doing the same thing. I mean, I mean I'm not Conrad, obviously, but, no. but Conrad, for all of his life, he dressed like an Englishman, he married an Englishwoman, Jesse George, he acted like an Englishman, but he had this incredibly thick Polish accent. So, you know, and it, I felt the same thing. I had this name. You know, and the fact is, when people ask me, where are you from? So I would say, I'm from the Middle East. At that time, I didn't say I was from Palestine. I didn't say I was from, yeah, I said Middle East. I'm an Arab. Yeah. And I left it at that. Later on, I, bega I began to give it more prominence, because after all, it, it was where I was from. And that's what I think, that's why people like but, Conrad but, were important to but, me. But, but then develops this, this philosophical attitude. Yes. I mean, it begins with Conrad, yes. uh, identifying probably with his position, right. studying his books, right. trying to find um, the, the points of view you could recognize. And, and out of this grows the book Orientalism. It became an eye-opener. Um, it became even the beginning of a new way of dealing with the canon um, of Western culture. It opened it. Um, how did you experience the, the tremendous intellectual success of Orientalism? Well, as a total surprise. I mean, in fact, I didn't realize what I was writing. Uh, I, all I thought I was doing, very much under the influence of, uh, of my teachers, N not, only, not only the ones I'd actually had, but people who meant a lot to me. The, in, the, in the German school of philology, people like Auerbach and Spitzer, you know, the analysis yeah, the, the, the of, of literature. The great, yeah, because yeah. I, mean, I, I feel I belong to that tradition, although it's a tradition that wouldn't recognize me, you understand? I mean, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. but for me, it was something that I held on to. And I was also very influenced by Vico, uh, you know, teaching yourself. So I taught myself to read these texts in which descriptions of the Oriental appear in, in, in a lit basically a literary form. And I thought I was writing a history of an idea. I was totally unprepared for the reception because I couldn't, in the early days, I couldn't find a publisher or, you know, there was a kind of reluctant publisher, academic press. But when I actually wrote the book and a commercial publisher happened to see it at a friend's house or something whom I'd lent the manuscript to, they called me and they gave me a lot of money and they published it so it was published commercially. The response really taught me more about the book than the writing of it because I had no idea, I had no idea that what I had touched on a lot of issues at the society that had to do with questions of the other, which were becoming to know at the time, questions of resistance, which was now during you know, the, the, the last part of the Vietnam period and the, the rise of, you might say, identity politics, and above all, the, 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 a, a new type of history, which I yeah. apparently had written. I didn't realize I was writing. You know, when you sit down to write, you don't say, I'm on. writing a new history. Come on, no, you're I'm pulling serious. my leg. No, you're I'm pulling serious. my leg. You, you're writing this book based on a very personal experience, of right. a very painful yes. personal experience. Buried in the book. Yeah. Buried. Of it's course. Not, it's not the main point of the book. No, of course not. But yeah. it's, it's the, the, the underlaying uh, um, uh, layer of, of humorous ground right. of, the, of, of the book. Right. Um, going into the heart of the matter and right. telling them yes. about their way, limited way, yes. of dealing with the cultural history. Right. You don't think this is just a... a, a I honestly thought... No, no, no. <laughs> believe me. I honestly thought... Don't forget, I wrote the book entirely in isolation. Uh, I had nobody to, um, to talk to in that respect. I had nobody to uh, share my ideas with. I didn't realize what a formidable establishment I was taking on. Had I realized all of these things, I wouldn't have done it. You know, I probably wouldn't have done it. I'd have spent much more time reading and rereading and rewriting and so on and so forth. As it is, I wrote it, I can say, innocently. It then took on a life of its own, which has very little to do with my own experience of it. Um, nowadays, um, you see almost a, a subdivision of subdivision of subdivision in dealing with the arts. I mean, if you want to, to talk seriously about a, a, a novel by a, a 
homosexual writer, you at least have to be a homosexual yourself of his age and, and health. The same goes for all sorts of cu cultural minorities, based on the idea that um, the, the, the classical, canonic way of dealing with the arts is always um, um, the fruit of a power structure. Right. Um, if you see these tiny subdivisions, these isolations of parochial dealing with art history, you feel guilty? No. Not at all, because that has nothing to do with what I wrote. It's a misapprehension and a misappropriation. I say very, very clearly, does this mean, I ask the question, does this mean that only Orientals can write about the Orient, that only women can write about women, that only blacks can write about blacks, that only homosexuals can write about, I say absolutely not. I believe, and this is, you might say there's a contradiction in the book that several people have picked up, namely, there's a contradiction between the humanism of the book and the anti-humanism of the system it describes. On the other hand, I retain my faith in the, human, in, in, in the humanist tradition, that it's possible to deal with discrepant experiences truthfully without resolving them into simple things like only women should write about women, only Chicanos should write about Chicano, only Latinos should write about Latino. I, I, I think that's the most damaging crime, uh, mis crime yeah. and mis misapprehension of what I'm saying. Yeah. That's why they debate all these things and they trace them back to me and people say, you did that. I, I say, absolutely not. I'm talking from a universalistic, if you like, cosmopolitan point of view to which I adhere and which is the only way that the world makes sense to me. I don't believe in the politics of identity. Although in many ways, paradoxically, I seem to be the father of identity politics. But it's a thing I totally disbelieve in because I realize the damage that identities have done. Not only in power and powerless, uh, powerful and powerless, but also identities between each other. Don't forget, I grew up in an environment in Jerusalem. This is very powerful. Where my earliest apprehension was of communities locked in struggle with each other. And I don't mean Jews and Arabs. I mean Christians and Christians. Yes. My earliest memories of going to the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem was my older cousin telling me, this is the Greek Orthodox Chapel, the same church, the Greek Orthodox Chapel, and then feeling um, somebody pulling at my jacket and saying, no, no, don't believe him. That's the, their version of Christianity. Christ was buried here in the Armenian Chapel. That's what I grew up with. And I hated it ever since. You see, because I think that is the end of, of humanism. It's the end of human community. Communities aren't made up of, of, of divisions of this sort, but rather of overcoming the divisions without destroying the differences. I think yeah, the differences yeah. are important. So, so that is stressing universalistic, universalistic yes, uh, uh, value, standpoint, but not a relativist. No, not, a rel not at all. I mean, relativism strikes me as a cop-out and saying, well, you know, everything you know. I believe very strongly in universal standards. For example, I think there is such a thing as great art, and I don't care whether, you know, whether the great art is written by a white man or a black woman or a red something or other. Oh, if it's great art, it's great art. Yeah. Uh, I have no problem with that at all. And people who come and tell me, well, yes, but your main interest seems to be people like Flaubert and Dickens and so on. They're dead white males. So I say, so what? If there's a great uh, Arabic novelist, I write about him too. Yeah. But I refuse to fall into the position of saying, well, some art is great, but, but it's only good for them. I mean, it, it's either good or not. And as I grow older, I, I'm much more interested in the problem, let's say, of aesthetics. I think there's a definite branch of human activity, which I call the aesthetic, which has its own privileges, which has its own, uh, which has its own domain, which I am interested in preserving. This doesn't at all mean, however, this doesn't at all mean, however, that the aesthetic is immune to various affiliations and connections. I mean, look what, look what the Nazis did with Meistersinger. Look what the Nazis did with Fidelio. I mean, you know, these are works that you could describe, and I have described myself, as works of liberation. But at the same time, they can be put to different uses. So I think there's the aesthetic, but there's also the appropriation of the aesthetic. And I think one has to be able to deal with both of them. That's always also a question of balancing your position as a reader, as a critic, as a scholar, and as a citizen. Right. On a certain moment in your biography, politics breaks through. It must have been around about 67. What happened? Uh, the world I knew was shattered. I mean, I experienced the war of 67, the Arab-Israeli War of June 1967, in New York. Um, and there, um, in a city where there were no Arabs that I knew. Don't forget, I, I, all my education was in Western literature. There were no Arabs, neither at Princeton when I was an undergraduate, nor at Harvard uh, when I was a graduate student, who were studying what I was studying. There were some Arabs whom I knew who were studying Middle Eastern literature and some doing science. In America. In America, yeah. which I've always opposed, by the way. Yeah. I mean, I think the 
it's crazy to come to America to study your own literature. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, you can do it better over there. Uh, and in any case, all of a sudden, I found myself uh, almost by, um, you know, by magnetic attraction taken to the UN where an old friend of mine, an Egyptian, suddenly appeared, called me up. He said, Edward, we're here, delegation, etc. We're trying to make some, rescue something out of that immense destruction of, of, of our world. And very soon I was involved with Arabs in the reconstruction effort. So very Generally soon you became a Palestinian? No, 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 that was a little later. That, that took place later. I was discovered by an old friend of mine from Princeton who was a Palestinian, who was you know, a graduate student at Princeton, who called me up after, I would say, fifth, um, t almost 12 years of not seeing him. In 68, he was putting together a book on the war of 67 from an Arab point of view. There was a need for an Arab voice. I mean, all we heard was the triumphalism of Israel, the triumph of the West, the triumph of this, that, and the other thing, the destruction of Abdel Nasser. I mean, it, the chorus was deafening, and I had no way to express it. And then I got this providential phone call from my friend, and I wrote an essay called The Arab Portrayed, in which I tried to, for the first time in my life, to give voice to the silent Arab, the oppressed Arab, the Arab who was being shot and killed, beginning with a Palestinian, but also going back in literature to the Arab of the Orientalists. That was the first experience I had. And then in the late 60s, 69, 70, for the first time in my life, I went to Jordan, where most of my family had gone after 48. I went to stay with my cousin. I'd never been in Jordan before. And while I was there, I discovered friends and distant relatives of mine who had become part of the Palestinian movement. And I immediately cultivated their friendship, and they drew me in. And by the early 70s, I was part of the movement. So it, but here that, came, here came the distant cousin from America, by then a professor, uh, to Jordan, mm -hmm. um, embraced by the family? Yes, embraced by the family, and, and, and I discovered very soon, embraced by the family in Arabic, that there was, you know, my background, the English literature, the comparative literature, Auerbach, Panofsky, Spitzer, yeah. or it meant nothing there. I very quickly determined that I would have to re-educate myself. And a year later, I came to the Middle East and spent a year in 1972 or 1971 in Beirut, literally re-educating myself 10 or 12 hours a day in Arabic. Why so? Remorse? Guilt? No, no, no. Uh, the ne fantastic need for articulation. I realized the hottest thing about that period, and it's a pity it's lost, was a renaissance in analysis and thinking of a kind that I had never experienced. For me, the experience of Arab nationalism, of the Arab post-imperialist phase, beginning with independence after the British left, yeah. was a lot of rhetorical phrases which I couldn't understand. The difference between that, again, on the linguistic level, that was so important, was that this was a language of the people. It was a spoken language. It was a language of communication. And I experienced politics as participation. Very early on, I met Arafat, you know, which would have been impossible in Egypt. I couldn't have met Abdel Nasser, but I could meet Arafat for the first time. I felt this was my movement. I was no longer out of place. This was my people. I was an American. Nobody seemed to hold that against me. But the one thing that I didn't have was fluency in the language. I had put it aside. I, like I said, I had put it on the yeah, shelf. Yeah. So then I studied. I studied Arab philology with a wonderful old professor who was a friend of my father's who taught me every day from 7 to 11 in the morning. We'd sit on his balcony in Beirut, and he, we would start from scratch. We started with Khalid ibn Ahmad, you know, the founder of Arabic philology, because I was interested in philology, which is what I had studied. And then by the end, I read Nagib Mahfouz for the first yes. time. I read Taha Hussein. I read Ibn Khaldun. I read Al Ghazali. I read all the classics of Arabic literature. And I was able to communicate all of this and retain my English and European yeah. fluency. Yeah. And again, it fitted in your idea of the canon. Absolutely. Yeah. It fitted in my idea of the canon. And then I realized, and I was, one of, I think, one of the first to realize that a good part of our war against Israeli occupation would have to be in the West, in yeah. the Western mind. And there, my familiarity with that mind and with that, uh, that culture stood me in good stead because by then I was also armed with a, a very powerful knowledge of the, of the tradition from which I came. And I found it absolutely exhilarating to be able to move between the two. Your father brought you up with the idea that politics was not a thing you should do. Stay out of politics. This was politicizing your work. Your father dies in the same period. Mm. Does one thing connect to the other? I don't know. Um, no, because my, f well, in a way, yes and no, because my father was very worried that, uh, that uh, what he said, I, the last thing he ever said to me, 
He, was a, he, he had turned his face to the wall. I had come from New York. It was in the beginning of January or late January of 1971. He was dying of cancer. And we were talking about, I was involved in an argument with a professor at Columbia exactly about the Israeli occupation. My father read the correspondence. He knew the man who had been the American ambassador in Cairo and a friend of my father's. He was an American. And my father was disturbed that this man should turn against his son, against me. All of it concerning an Israeli visitor who was a colonel in the occupation army. And I attacked him in public. First thing I did in America, that was that. And my father, the last thing he said to me, he was going into a coma and I had to go back to New York. He said, I'm very worried about what the Zionists will do to you. And that was the last thing he said to me. Uh, I went to New York. By the time I got to New York, he had died. I came right back to Beirut. Uh, and I remembered that. And my, my troubles began then, in the early 70s. What did they do to you? Well, in the beginning, it was, they were mystified slightly by me, because at the same time, as you said, I was successful. I was a professor, and so on and so forth. So there would be criticism. I'd be attacked. I would be, by the, by, 10 years later, I was having death threats as a routine part of my life. In routine? Routine, yes, absolutely. I mean, I, was, I, w I would get the most horrible threats to me and my family. Yeah, by the late 70s, you know, five or six years later, uh, I remember we were on the run. Uh, there would be threats to my person, to my family. My office was burned. Uh, the abuse I got in the, um, in, the, in the press and so on was, it didn't stop me, you know, and I was, uh, I, I was supported by my family. My, my wife was very strong and we, because I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought that was terribly important. Uh, but very soon I became a kind of symbol, which I hated. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't want that role, but it was thrust upon me. And in 1977, I mean, at the time I was, you know, really, I, I, I was a hard at work in Orientalism. It was just about to appear. Yeah. I found myself, I opened the door one day and I found 300 journalists outside my door. Sadat had just said that he had named me to be the Palestinian representative at some peace talks at, with Arafat that they were going to have. And my whole life was transformed. I became a kind of public figure. And the rest of the time, since then, I've really been escaping that role. Was, was that inviting or repulsive? No, I found it repulsive. I suddenly discovered that I had no control over, over my public image. Yeah. But uh, the background is, is you, 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 you went to uh, Jordan, uh, studied the language and literature, came in touch with the movement, even met Arafat, and then you come back to the United States, a very eloquent man, a very acceptable man for them. Uh, I mean, no dark reminiscences, no, 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 no. Uh, association, etc. And you speak out. Yes. And you, you, you're clear yes. about your position. So and, and my position, I still believe... For a role. What? Applying for a role. Well, I didn't think so. I thought I was speaking the truth. And I thought I was saying things that hadn't been heard before. I had no idea. And to this day, I do not understand it. Why the depth of hatred and evil directed towards me by American Zionists is so great. I don't understand it. These are people who live in America, who have had no experience of the Middle East. I find it easier to talk to Israelis in Israel than I do to American Zionists. I, it's, it's quite extraordinary. Recently, there was a campaign against me by an American, again, American-Israeli, who attacked my early childhood. They found, for 30 years, I've been writing about Palestine. They couldn't refute me. So the one thing they found, they said, well, there are inconsistencies in the first five years of his life. So they attacked me. And I so then he spent three years he, he to spend the three first years. five years of your life. Well, yes. Completely mad. Completely yeah. mad. In any case, he never talked to me. He never asked me any questions. Anything. He said it, it wasn't necessary. He did it all from the records. Be that as it may. I wrote a rebuttal because the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, all the major newspapers carried either articles by him or about this. I submitted a rebuttal. None of them would publish it. Not one American paper would publish it. Acting on a whim, I said, let me send it to Haaretz in Israel. They published it the next day in Hebrew. So I could publish more easily in Israel than I can in the United States. Quite yeah. extraordinary. This has something to do with the subtlety of your discourse, of your um, position, um, which is, of course, accepting um, history as it is right. and trying to improve upon the existing, existing situation. Brilliant. You that, put it brilliant. That, brilliant. Is, that is... No, not the existing situation, on coexistence. On actually. coexistence, yes. Coexistence, yes. Um, that is a very reasonable point. Yeah. Can you understand why that has attracted opposition from all possible camps? Including Palestinians. Including, including Palestinians. Palestinians. Yeah, because, because here we come back to the question of identity again and the idea that I want my own place. As a young friend of my son told me, who had been tortured by the Israeli, uh, and he told me this in 1996, 
And I said, what do you do now? He said, I work for the Palestinian Authority. I said, what do you do there? He said, I'm an interrogator and a spy. I said, for whom? For them. I said, but you were tortured by the Israelis. He said, yeah, now it's my turn. In other words, if they tortured, now it's our turn to torture. If we have police, now it's our, if they have police, we have. I mean, that's a twisted law. That's a distortion of, of liberation. I mean, that we, in the end, we're creating a kind of mirror image of what happened to us. And I think the reasonable thing is to say, that, and this is very difficult for Palestinians to accept. I'm the first Palestinian to say this publicly. Yes, we have to admit that the Jews are the, the, of Israel are the survivors of the Holocaust. The Holocaust actually occurred. Many people don't believe that or believe that if it did occur, it has no relevance. I think it has a relevance. But on the other hand, I also feel that that shouldn't be used as a way of punishing us. We had nothing to do with the Holocaust. We can acknowledge their suffering, and they must acknowledge our suffering. And then we can live together in a state of coexistence, in a state of citizenship. I mean, that's why the idea of citizenship is much more important for me than the idea of having my own state, which is impossible in Palestine, a real state given that Jews and Arabs are so interlinked. My, my How could home. anybody oppose to so much well, reasonableness? You'd be, uh, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. They say, we don't want to live with them. Explain it. Well, you're the scholar. Well, I think it's a deep-seated attitude of hatred of the other, fear of the other, ignorance of the other, very important ignorance of the other. You'd be, I mean, extraordinary experience. Last summer, uh, in, in 1999, August, under the auspices of, uh, of, uh, of the German government, Baron Boehm, who's an Israeli musician, Yo-Yo Ma, who's Chinese, American, myself, bring to Weimar, cultural capital of Europe, in 1999, a group of Arab musicians from Syria, from Egypt, from Jordan, from Palestine, and a group of Israeli young people between the ages of 18 and 25. They sit in an orchestra together for three weeks, trained by Baron Boehm. In the beginning, they can hardly talk to each other. Uh, the, the Israeli, I remember the first night, and I was the discussion leader. The first night, one of the Israeli cellists says, listen, I'm a soldier. I didn't come here to hobnob with the Arabs. When I finish this three weeks here, I'm going to go to Lebanon, I'm going to have to kill Arabs. I don't want to talk to them. The same guy, by the end of the three weeks, had fallen in love with a Syrian violinist, right? And he suddenly forgot all about his, you know, his past and so on. And the same with the Arabs. All of yeah. these things, through experience and together yeah. and not and it was totally unpolitical I think this is the way to go you're going to go back to the Middle East to yes. teach I'm going to teach uh, yes you know for a short period of time I can't be well, away well, because well. of because of my illness. I want to go to Palestine uh, and teach what well, are you going to teach them I want to teach them Western literature Western uh, Western thought and and put it in Arabic terms I'm going to do it in Arabic and constantly compare uh, you know, these, the same kinds of things that exist in the Arabic tradition. For example, the notion of the memoir. I'll teach uh, Rousseau, Augustine, uh, John Stuart Mill, and I'll teach the Arabic tradition of, of memoir and autobiographical writing, of which is a great tradition of Al Ghazali, of Tahsin, etc., etc. In, like 19, in 1942, till the end of the 40s, British people came to Cairo, to Victoria College, to teach you snow on the English hills, the enclosure system, and now you're going to Palestine to teach him John Stuart Mill. Well, what's the difference? The difference is that this is part of liberation, that I think what I'm trying to contribute to is a liberation of the Palestinian from the ghetto in which he's been placed. He will be trained to understand the other as something that he can do or she can do, very important. Men and women can understand the other as an equal, not to read it as an inferior, but to say this is part of experience too. We have our experience, they have their experience, this is a common human experience. That's what I'm interested in, in doing. The idea of a common human experience with difference, but where difference isn't used to dominate over the other. Univers it's universalistic again. Very universalistic, yeah. as much as I can. Is there a specific role for music in pleading universalism? Yeah, I think so. I, in other words, I think, I think for, for a whole generation, I didn't know this until recently, in the last couple of years, there's a whole generation of young musicians who are very gifted at Western music, who are also extremely trained, well-trained in the Arabic tradition. And there's some, uh, this is an important discovery for me. For example, there's a violinist who lives in New York called Simon Shaheen. He's a Palestinian. But he's also, he's a classical, he tr was trained at Juilliard, Right? But he's also trained in the Kamanja tradition. It's the same instrument, tuned differently. A very rare thing. Yeah, yes, very, yes, very rare, yes. but, he, but he combines the two. And I think that also can be, can be put to, to our advantage, that we can break out of the confinement, to use a 
phrase right. from Foucault, and enter a community where we are as, as the others are. The important thing is to overcome separation. See, I don't believe, I've never, philosophically, I think separation is an instrument of power designed to keep the inferior inferior. And so I want to overcome that as much as possible through music, through literature, through thought, and through personal experience. Thank you very much, Edward for this splendid conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you.